Hey everybody, Jack Carr here. The Terminal List is coming to Amazon Prime Video. That's right, 4th of July weekend, July 1st, all eight episodes drop at once. The Terminal List stars Chris Pratt as Navy SEAL sniper James Reese, and he absolutely crushes it. So we have Chris Pratt starring, we have David Agilio as the showrunner who said this in a recent interview, the biggest movie of the summer is actually an eight episode streaming series. Awesome. Antoine Fuqua directing, producing, absolutely incredible cast that includes Constance Wu, that includes Taylor Kitsch, Gene Triplehorn, amazing cast, crew, special operations veterans on set each and every day to make sure that the series stayed rooted in the dark, gritty, primal, authentic foundation of the novel. And I could not be more fired up with how it came out. Amazon was an amazing partner throughout all of this. So get ready. Things are about to get rowdy. This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the Books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My guest today, Marcus Torgerson, world-renowned expert in the martial art Krav Maga. We got to talk about his time in Israel, traveling around the world, teaching and teaching instructors and the obstacles he has overcome in his life. Uh, I was really looking forward to this conversation. So now, without further ado, Marcus Torgerson. Well, I mean, we linked up early on, on, uh, you know, on social media, like it was, uh, yeah. you know, I had like two followers and, uh, no book. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't think the book had even, that, well, not many more. And I, I don't even know if the first book had even come out, but, uh, you know, we linked up, I knew of you right, right away. I don't know if it's algorithm wise or seeing you with the skill set guys, or, you know, we have mutual friends and, you know, mutual right. interests and, you know, overlapping, yeah. uh, uh, interests and acquaintances and friends and, you know, all that sort of a thing. Uh, so we we became aware of each other early, like really early on. Yes, well, I'm sir. still figuring yes, out the sir. social media stuff, like a little kind of wading yeah. into it, you know, because it was very odd for me to start sharing well, yeah. things, you know, and it's still, yeah. it's still, you know, uh, I don't know, it's still a little bit odd because, you know, you put yourself out there and people you don't know mm -hmm. can just shoot arrows at you, you know? So it's like oh, a very yeah. strange, yeah. strange thing, yeah. you know? Like I wouldn't do that yeah. tactically on the battlefield. You know, I wouldn't just be like, no. and here I am in the middle of a field, yeah. no cover or concealment, yeah. you know, take your no. shots, you know? So yeah. it's very odd to do that on social channels, but at the same time, yeah. it's like, hey, that's the storefront. And, uh, you know, that, that's where you're, uh, where you can do things that authors couldn't have done 30 years ago and you can engage and no. I can, thank people. That's the main thing for me. I can yeah. thank people yeah. for taking a risk on me and allowing me to do what I love to do, which is write in this next chapter in life. But, uh, but that was early on. So we linked up when I was first, just like wading into that world. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, I want to go back before that though. But, um, but do you remember when we first linked up or we first heard of each other or how did, well, your I, I know, I know that, um, I hadn't had access to your book yet. And I was going, I was traveling and I went through DFW and they had, uh, they had the book there. And so I took a picture of it, <laughs> took a picture of me with it and said, I haven't been able to read this. You guys need to go and read this. And then you were really generous afterwards about just contact me as you have been for all this time. And then I, I fell in love with the book and then I started really pushing the book and, and our interactions were, were this kind of snowballed from there. And then I got to see you in, uh, at your book signing for true believer. Yep. Yep. And, yeah. uh, and you'd come out, but you, you have a connection to, you know, Salt Lake city area. You, I think you came out and did That's right. one or two things with the national ability. That's Center. right. Uh, we'll yep. talk about those and then, uh, coffee, you have a, a coffee at the kind of the yep. base of the, yep. the hill here relationship That's with those right. guys. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I want to yeah. talk about all that alpha coffee. Good. Um, and, uh, but man, before that, your path into, into what you're doing now, combatives and, and, uh, martial arts and, and all the rest of that stuff. What's that path? Cause I realize I don't know that much about the, uh, the beginnings. Well, it, actually, in, in many ways, we're kind of parallel in a ways because of the fact that you did what you did with JKD and, and, the, and the box and the things that you did. Mine was at a young age, really young, like 10. And it's, it's a little cliche-ish, but, you know, I was getting my butt kicked on a regular basis. And then, you know, I was able to go learn some Kung Fu. And the guy that taught me was the guy who tortured Rambo in the, in the first movie. 
No you way. You mean Rambo First scene? Blood Part? Oh, in the first the, movie. Yeah. The flashback. The very first movie. No yeah. way. And where that are was, you living at the yeah. time? Where are you? In Vancouver, Canada. You're in Vancouver. Okay. Because that's where they, they, yeah. they, uh, they filmed up there. That, for, yep, for that. just about uh, 20 or 30 minutes in Hope. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was supposed to be Hope, yeah. Washington, you know, state. Yeah, but well, they, it was, yeah, it was but they close. filmed it. In, they filmed it in <laughs> British Columbia. Um, yeah, it was cheaper to film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but what a great film. So no way. So yeah. how old are you? You track this guy down? Um, there. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was about 11 or 12 yeah. ish when I started doing some real formal training. And then it just kind of, that was my, that was my everything. Martial arts was, I ate, slept, drank, everything. And it just went from obsession to, to grand obsession. I started doing this stuff called Wushu, which is what Jet Li was doing back in the day. Really fancy, no, no applications whatsoever to violence. Uh, And I took a small, small break only because there's so many political things going on in martial arts Mm. that has always upset me. Yeah. And then I started doing in my late tw- early twenties, late twenties. I did a style of uh, karate called Weichiru. Very, very tough. A lot of body conditioning. Um, very traditional. That was phenomenal. And then I definitely took a bit of a break there because Taibo started coming out. You remember Taibo? I remember Taibo. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks to Billy, Billy Blanks, Blanks. Yeah. Yeah. For- teaching everything he's also in the last boy scout it. by the way in the opening scene well, that's right i wasn't going to say the scene that he said but that was a great scene <laughs> yeah billy cole crazy billy cole crazy yeah um but because of his tapes i was a personal trainer that's been my pretty much my job since 1988 um but because everybody kept hurting themselves i ended up with a whole new genre of work teaching kickboxing, which I never even thought about doing back then. But thanks to all the injuries of my clients, I ended up having a whole new revenue stream as a result. And then, uh, you know, in 2005, I was in some dark times a little bit before that, kind of like after my son was born, went pretty dark. And then 2005, uh, I'm, I'm a man of faith. So I believe that God came in and said, okay, you, you're lost. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And a whole bunch of things happened in 2005. And one of them was I ended up going to Israel for a month doing the Krav Maga in a very unique situation where I was taught one-on-one uh, for my instructor course. And that's never happened. My instructor has never before or after ever done a personalized instructor course. And it was 30 days of go, 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 which... That's why I, I smile so much about the new book with all the Israeli yeah. uh, references. I start giggling. Nice. So that's really, and that's, and so for 10 years, I traveled the world certifying people in Krav Maga. And I've recently retired from that. And, uh, but the, the combatives world and martial arts in general, I'm, I, I it will never leave my blood. It'll yeah. be there till my last breath. Okay. And so then, uh, so growing up before you discovered the uh, martial arts and how did you find it? Was it like yellow book back then? Like uh, the Vancouver it was yellow book. Yeah. Yeah. I I'll be honest with you. I don't. And it's, it's so weird. You brought this question because it's perplexed me. How did I end up at that specific school? Cause yeah. it wasn't close by. I had to take two buses okay. to get to his school. And I think I, the yellow pages had to have a big, cause I can remember now the yellow pages, yeah, yeah. his ad, I can picture his ad yeah. and it was one of the biggest ads we had in the yellow pages. So that would more than likely how I ended up at this school. Yep. And that's how I found Stephen my first Chang. one too. Yeah. Uh, yellow pages, Is it? you know, yeah. You open it up, boom, boom, boom. And, uh, I remember I was distracted by a big flashy ad. Um, it was farther away from the house and it, you know, it was talking about had a bunch of like weapons and all this stuff in there. I'm like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but then just <laughs> logistics wise, that wasn't going to happen. Logistical. I think I went like once or twice. Um, and then, uh, went to like a lot of people, you know, the, the local Taekwondo school, you know, just the yeah. one that was yeah. close by that, uh, that I could go to. And, um, of course back then, you know, you have those, those magazines, you have black belt, you had, uh, oh, yeah. I think Kung Fu, yeah. I think maybe a third, Kung there Fu. wasn't many though. I mean, this is yeah, like Karate mid-80s. illustrated was one that was in there in the eighties. Yeah, yeah. A few started yeah. coming on later. Yeah. There was one, I, gosh, I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, but, um, Frank Cucci was on the cover and it was like called, oh man, I forget what it was, but I saw that and this was later on and I'm like, wow, Seal. And I had a couple of his videos. Right. So I knew who he was. There was like VHS tapes out there or something. Oh my goodness, uh, really? With him, yeah. And uh, I was like, oh man, Seal and guy doing this uh, this thing. I don't even think they called it combatives. It's possible they were just starting to call it that. I'm not sure though. Um, and I got that article and I'm like, oh man, but 
Virginia Beach was, I mean, that might have well, as well been around the world, you know, back yeah, then. True story. You know, everything yeah. seems so yeah. much closer because of social media, but, uh, yeah. but it, that might as well have been, you know, could have, could have been anywhere in the could world. Could have been Mars yeah, because exactly. that's how far it was. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, local, local Taekwondo school for, for me went down yeah. there and then just started learning. And obviously it's mostly, you know, balance and coordination and yeah. strength and, yeah. and that sort of thing, uh, flexibility. Yeah. Um, but you're still, even mindset wise, you know, it's, oh, doing, yeah. it's doing things yeah. mindset wise discipline wise, oh, yeah. um, all of that, you're doing some weapons, although it's forms and, and that sort yeah. of thing. Um, yeah. and then, and then you can take the the step from there, but it was harder back then. You know, if you didn't have a boxing gym close yeah. by, uh, you know, it was harder to, I think to make that transition from something oh, yeah. that was more, I'm not, not ceremonial, but you know, you know what I mean? It's like not, you know, if you get yep. smashed in the face by somebody outside, you know, doing your, your kata might not be. Yeah. That, that move. spinning hook kick isn't yeah. going to do anything <laughs> yeah. when that guy steps yeah. in and flash you one. Exactly. Yeah. Now, obviously way easier. I mean, now you can't throw a yeah. rock without hitting oh. a Brazilian jiu-jitsu school or something oh my that's goodness, made, you know, mixed martial arts something. in there and tie yeah, box, yeah. like the whole, the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah. back then it was a little, little harder. You hadn't had to put it together yourself. You had to figure, be like, <laughs> okay, this is really cool. But you know, I'm watching boxing on TV and I'm right. kind of worried, like, why are their hands up here? Why are the, you right. know, the commentators yeah. always talking about hands down, keeping them up and, and that sort of a thing. And then you talk to a boxer, you go to someplace, you find a boxing yeah. gym or you go there and then you start learning, you know, uh, how, how to move. And you're like, wait a second, how might to move? Cause be that a little guy's better. Back yeah. This yeah. might be a little better than just standing in place and like doing this, you know, that, and so you, but you had yeah. to put it together. You had to kind of put it together in your, in your head, yeah. uh, back yeah. then. So, but it was, that was fun. That was all, all part of it. And uh, finding, yeah. uh, you well, know, Jeet Kune Do is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then, I mean, then you talk about the Bruce Lee influence yeah. on North America, mm -hmm. right? I mean, let's be honest that if it wasn't for him, there would not be anybody else. I so, mean, uh, yeah, I mean, still to this day, uh, take what is useful, discard what is useless. Um, useless. you know, yep. and that just, I mean, really that were the, that was the beginning of MMA essentially in my oh, mind. Yeah. Oh, of course. You know, yeah. taking things yeah. in. I mean, they had some stuff, he had, he had a couple a move from fencing with your feet, like this switch step yep. with, uh, from, yep. from Western fencing. And then you have, that's right. Of course, uh, you know, regular, you know, wrestling, uh, and then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu early nineties and man, most yep. of JKD, I think are the, the, my, my little segment of it, uh, adopted that right away. They're like, Oh, Oh yeah. You're not yeah. good on the ground. You know, we've done oh, some yeah, wrestling no, no. things, but it's mostly been based upon, you know, a score system, you know, like, you know, yep. but Hey, what are these guys doing on the ground? All right. Okay. That's and right. Then you add some yeah. of the, you add biting. Remember like the whole Filipino, like oh, yeah. biting thing biting, to yeah. it and, yeah. and all yeah. those things, which was, which was crazy. And that, that gets your attention. When you're on oh, the ground sure and rolling, does. and then someone just yep. puts their, their, Takes a their chunk. yeah, in your neck, yep. and you're like, ah, I mean, it's like you get yeah. a reaction, you know? Yeah. Yep. That was crazy, but not many people in the early 90s were doing that. Like, you felt like well, you were. No, kinda because there's still edge. rules. Everyone, well, if you remember as a kid, you were told real men don't spit, bite, pull hair, or kick to the groin. Now we know for a fact that those are the, <laughs> those things are the first things you should do to create opportunities to escape. So it's funny how things have come. Uh, full circle. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I bet. So you, so probably the yellow pages, you find this school, you go there yep. and yeah. how did you put together that the guy was in first blood? Like, did you visually? I didn't or was know it like that. A, well, well, his ego was the size of, Oh, so he Seattle. let you know. Okay. Oh, he, he let everybody know he was in this movie <laughs> or this movie and he had pictures all over. Of, oh, you know, got it. Got it. Okay. Kind of like the Bruce Lee ones with the muscles. And nice. now ironically, his, his pedigree for the style of Kung Fu that he did was actually really solid. Like I did background on him at later, much later, mm. but it just wasn't enough for him. He, he gotten a taste of, of film and fame mm. and, and I can't knock it because I wouldn't have been in that school or any of the other people had he not advertised as seen in, you know, this Got movie, it. that movie, that okay. ad. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. You know, I mean, it adds like back then that adds credibility. You're like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Must be yeah. good because you couldn't check on anything. He was like, oh. No, <laughs> no, you know? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> you know, I got a Chinese guy that's been in movies and can obviously and was very, he was a great performer great performer so he knew exactly what to do when to do and how to do it mm. uh in those days he's he was above above the average curve from oh, everyone man. else wow so yeah. doing that what so what were you uh what was your childhood before that like growing up in in vancouver well yeah this is where it gets a little murky only because i grew up in a in an alcoholic home so you know my mother as much as 
there's negative. The positive is always how I look back at her integrity and on still, still raising me, even though there was a lot of background that was negative. You know, she didn't really, you know, didn't really want me. And yet she still fed me, still took me to Kung Fu, right? I didn't get to the class by myself, yeah. right? So as, as I've grown older, my appreciation for her as a parent has really shined through because, you know, it doesn't, even though words hurt and you can say things that hurt somebody's feelings, actions still in time show perhaps their true feelings. Yeah. You know, even my mom was not happy with her life. She still went and did things for me that, that she didn't have to do. Oh. And, you know, we were on welfare in the beginning. She worked her way off of welfare. Now she was a, she was an alcoholic. I mean, full blown alcoholic yet still was able to hold down a job five days a week, 40 hours, a you know, 40 hours a week wow. and drink on the weekends. And my childhood up until, you know, even at 10, it was really not good because I'd had some negativity with, with being um, sexually assaulted as a child. And there's all these things going on yet. Martial arts was always that, that one thing that for a while was always going to be good for me. And I sit back and I look back at my childhood from, you know, my dad died when I was two or under two, I think. So I didn't have any male, any male role models whatsoever. Um, I grew up with women, my mother, my aunt, my, my grandmother, all alcoholics, all like racist, which is funny because my first, you know, all my girlfriends have been either Asian, uh, black or anything but white, except for my second wife. Uh, so you know, there's turmoil in my house and all these things, but I still have good memories now when I think back about how amazing it must, how hard it must have been for her to be a mother when she didn't want to be, have to work and be an alcoholic. I mean, the stress on that could, I can't even put it into words, what she must have been going through. Yeah. Oh. So that's my, that's my childhood. Oh, geez. Did you More block out the sexual assault thing for a while? Or how does that? No, no, no. I, um, well, I didn't really get a choice. When that first sexual assault happened, I ended up telling my mom a few days later. And now, again, to say something about my mom, to her tenacity, that word tenacity, she went over next door with an axe in her hand or a bat, something violent, and he'd already moved. But she was ready to go, like, go to toe-to-toe with this guy. Um, so, so she, her again, her actions were different than what she, the, 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 the very cruel things she would say. Um, and then, you know, since we're on topic of sexual. So when I was 16, my martial arts instructor also molested me. So the amazing part about all of that is there's, there is a thought process of, Oh, woe is me. But I look at it now at my age of 50 something and the conversations I've had with men and women, if I hadn't had those things happen, well, then I wouldn't be able to have the conversations I do that really have changed a lot of people's perspectives of the, it, it's not really about a victim mentality, but more just embracing the positive out of it and looking that the negative will benefit someone some way, somehow. And it's just how you, it's how you, how you flip the script. You know, you're not, you're not special. You've been given a situation or a scenario. What is the lesson that has to be learned from it? And that's my biggest takeaway from my childhood has been, What's been the takeaway? I've had all these scenarios that, that a lot of people have been like, oh, Marcus, I'm sorry for you. Well, I'm not sorry because I'm sa- I've saved a lot of lives. I know that for a fact, not with arrogance, from people who are going to kill themselves because they think that they're alone in their internal struggle in their head about how bad their life is. And when all of a sudden they see they're not alone and that you can survive and thrive and, and do something good with it, well, then there's that little glimmer of hope and with a little bit of hope, miracles can happen. Man, when was the, when was the first go. time you decided, like, you were like, oh, man, I can, I can help somebody with my experience. And uh, I can, I can yeah, be, a, be an influence on them that, that, uh, that helps them out of a, a dark place or, or helps them move forward. Was it like through martial arts and through training or, uh, yeah. or, or not? No, believe it or not. Are you familiar with the name David Rutherford? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. All right. So, uh, 15 years ago or so when he came out with his book, he was really big online and frog logic, just frog logic. Yeah. So I bought his book and I started reading it and it became my Bible. And when people sit there and say, Oh, Marcus, you know, the, the way that you impact people and your positivity, 
I have to shed light on him because his book and his ways, Frog Logic, altered my verbiage on what I would say. I didn't know what a swim buddy was. I didn't know what cold, wet, and sandy was. I didn't know what a negative insurgency was. And because of that verbiage, altering how I view things and how I speak, it manifested in ways that I can't even put into perspective. So from changing my verbiage and changing how I looked at things, and then all of a sudden coming to terms with, hey, man, you know, you, 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 this happened for a reason. Now, my sobriety has really opened up a lot of that. Like being sober really kind of goes, wait a second. Okay, I got one more thing to add to the, the, mm. to the chalkboard on what I can talk to somebody about. Mm. And when they're being ambushed by a negative insurgency, David Rutherford, frog logic, uh, I, have the, I, have the, I have the permission in my brain of saying, okay, well, what can I do? How can I, how can I relate and resonate with this individual in a way that they'll hear what I have to say? Because at the end of the day, the, the biggest problem that the enemy gives us is that we're alone. You're alone. Nobody loves you. You're, you, you, this is your path for life. And until somebody comes by and gives you a verbal slap in the face and says, hey, man, you're not alone. And you're not, you're not special in the way of you're better than anybody else. and You're not worse than anybody else. You and I are the exact same. We bleed, crap, and cry the exact same way. So let me tell you what I've done. Or more importantly, let me hear what, what you're going through, yeah. right? God gave me two ears and one mouth. So I need to listen, give a little bit of feedback, and again, shine a little bright light of hope, which is where David Rutherford really did. He came in and, and just his, the way that he was, you, you know what he's like. Yeah, he's yeah, like, we knew each other like, back in the day in the SEAL teams. And then uh, I remember when he got out and positivity. someone told me, he's like, he's doing He's doing a uh, uh, speaking. He's a motivational speaker. I was like, "What?" Yeah. Like it was before it was yeah. a thing. Before any, in, you know, social media and all that stuff. Like he was That's early. Right. He yeah. was early in on that. Oh yeah. And he was yeah, and, he really and was passionate about it. Genuinely passionate oh. about it. I remember from those early days. Yeah. And he's still still doing it today. Yeah, he really is. And and now I'm I'm a little sad because he got. He was one of the first people to really get chokeholded by social media, which is ironic because he's the most not there's no reason to, to stifle David Rutherford. I mean, everything he says. Oh, is, really? What do you mean? I don't, what do you mean? I don't know. Well, he, the Instagram, uh, Instagram and Facebook just started choking his, his feeds and doing what they're doing to oh. us now. But back then, it was just basically on. like skip it. And he's still out talking, still doing stuff. And one day I'm going to meet that guy face to face. And, nice. and I'm telling you right now that, a lot of people have like heroes they want to meet. David Rutherford is one of those guys I just oh, want to hug awesome. and be like, dude, you have no idea the, the impact. that." Oh. And that's, that's what I think is important with people who are on a social media or a, at a level of, 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 of touching social media wise. Mm -hmm. The impact, the question is, are you doing stuff that makes people's lives better or worse? And it's that simple. And if you think you're doing better then brothers and sisters, yep, do better. If you think you're doing it worse because they're out, you're putting out nothing but vile grossness, then you know what? You got to answer for yourself, but yeah, I mean, that's why it's so important tool. who you, uh, who you follow is important because it's an input yep, and it you is. get to choose. I mean, that's, uh, you know, not that's always, I mean, sometimes part. those algorithms will throw things up. I'm noticing that more and more. I'm like, I don't follow this person, but it apparently yeah. knows me really well because it's like throwing some hair eighties band up there or whatever, or something like that. You know, uh, like how does it even know? I've never even paused on anything like that. Like they know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's so, it's so, it, it is so important, especially for kids, you know, who you choose to follow. Yes. Even if you think something is quote unquote funny, uh, but it's negative and it is just, yep. it's not adding value to your life or anybody else's. No. Uh, but you're looking at no. the numbers and maybe, and you're seeing this person yep. have a lot of quote unquote followers or whatever, yep. you know, the fame yep. and the, the, the Instagram That's right. space, the social media space. And uh, I don't know if it's a curiosity or a morbid, <laughs> morbid curiosity, but, uh, so who you follow is important. And then uh, it is. as a person, you know, what it, Hey, it, it is important how you, how you carry yourself. But the other side oh, of that is yeah. that authenticity piece. So the people that are out there yeah. being negative and vile, not adding value to people's lives, regardless of the mm -hmm. number of followers, where, whether it's yeah. one or 50 million, um, yeah. like, uh, it, it, they're, they get to choose and, uh, yeah. then you in turn get to choose. Yeah. So that and authenticity it's not rock piece science. is, uh, yeah, that authenticity Unfollow, piece is out there. Move. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. You know, it's not, you don't need to, you don't need to announce anything. Just, Oh, yeah. I don't like where this is going. See you later. Bye. Yep. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. it is important, especially for kids, but even for adults, oh. uh, even, even yeah. for adults, I mean, because you're getting that input and that's one, okay. You got one negative input, but you've chosen to follow someone who is right. constantly yeah. negative or harping or, yeah. or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. but not adding value yep. to your life. But if you put it in those terms, like, is this person adding value to my life? Uh, yeah. and yeah. maybe if you just want to sit there and get negative inputs and that you think that is value, yeah, which, I guess. which is cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's, fine. there's a make, lot of people that do make Misery choices, loves company, but how's right? that going to impact you? And then what, like, like I see comments, it's fascinating to me. Um, and I use it for character development in, uh, in the novels because it's one it's therapeutic and you know, Hey, people are, yeah. uh, you're giving me some, some, uh, some negative comments and like thinking, why would you take the limited time you have on this earth to spend five seconds to spend five yep. minutes, uh, yep. writing something horrible, unnecessary, um, to ruin someone else's day. You've taken time out of your day to try to ruin yep. someone else's. That's what you decided to do mm-hmm. with your limited time on earth. Yep. I mean, it's, it's yep. wild. It is abs- it is. But it, it, it makes sense though. It does make sense if when they look in the mirror and they dislike who they are so yeah. much that that, that I need to share that misery with someone. And, and if I'm miserable, then I'm going to make somebody else miserable. And it doesn't matter how you present it in your brain. At the end of the day, that's what you're doing. And I, and I, I prefer people to be that way because at least I see who they are then. Right? Don't, I don't want you coming out throwing kisses and then all of a sudden you're going to sucker punch me. Mm. Come, out, come out swinging and filled with ugliness so I can make my choice. You know what? I think we need to distance ourselves from this situation. Oh, yeah. Have a good day. Right. Yeah, it's and so on social freeing. media, everybody and their mother has something to say. I personally have loved your, uh, your, your reading the negative comments <laughs> only because of how, how it just flips everything and your, and, and it brings light it says, here's what people are saying. And all of us who are, you know, fanatics, I'm a fanatic of, of Jack Carr. I admit it. I'm in a support group right now and we sit there and, and we're like, I can't believe you took the time to, to write that. What is wrong with you? Some people you know? write some long ones and I'll just pull out some of the gems because you know, I can't only really sit there reading for 10 oh minutes, my goodness, but yeah. someone took no. time, took time out of their day to write a very long, horrible review. Yeah. Sometimes not a verified purchase and you can tell that they haven't even read it. The characters are misspelled or it's the wrong thing or that character's not even right. in the book that they're reviewing. It's like, I yeah, mean, but so I just pull out some of the gems that uh, allow me to kind of turn it into a positive. But uh, uh, but I, eventually I'm gonna have to stop that because I even though I turn them into a positive, yeah. I still have it's to still. wade through them and pull them out. And well, and it's still coming into healthy. you, exactly. yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, so, so I don't know how yeah, much longer I'll, gonna... I'll keep doing that. But uh, no, no, I don't, and I don't blame you. <laughs> it's 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 kind of like the the redacted thing when you first did the redacted thing. It was like, oh man, that's cool. But now it's ridiculous. There's no need to have the redacted things because you don't do anything that isn't open source in some way, shape, or form anyway. So yeah. I always it, thought it was ridiculous, but I was like, oh man, I'm so close to being in the Navy still. You know, I was out, obviously, but yeah. still close um, when we're looking at it from a, a time perspective. Um, so I just right. want to make sure. So I, so I sent it in. But, but what they took out, the first one was nine sentences or passages or yeah. just things. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. that wasn't very much. And I was like, oh, okay. And they got back in 45 days with that one. And then uh, I didn't appeal. That was for terminal list? That was for terminal list. That was for terminal Yeah. Okay. And uh, I didn't appeal that one because I didn't have any money to pay lawyers <laughs> to, to appeal it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we'll just I just stop was just right like, there. Yeah, yeah. Man, that's good. Um, and then I uh, submitted that second one, True Believer, and that, that took almost seven months. So I had to push a publication date into a not <laughs> from a good time into a not so good time. Um, yeah. uh, when you're looking at other books coming out and all that stuff and your position right, as a new author right. and all that sort of thing, but you know, you just, you do what you gotta do. And, uh, that, yeah. that one was 54, if memory serves 54 redactions. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. uh, this time I appealed. So, uh, this time I appealed and had lawyers re, uh, find tie every single one of those redactions to a publicly available government document. <laughs> The uh, the key word there being government document, not like, oh, it's yeah, already out there. Right. No, it had to be no. available from our government to anyone in the world. So they right. tied every yeah. single one of those 54. And then I won on 37 of them. But I think they didn't like this next part because then I published the paperback with the, un, the what I won on unredacted. Right. So people could take yeah. that hardcover and take that paperback and, and compare right. yeah. and be like, well, why yep. did they take this CIA black site in Morocco out of this cool. one, which I made up by the way. Yeah. Uh, and they took okay. out Atlas mountains. They took out uh, Moorish architecture. They took out anything that would give any indication it was, it was Morocco. Um, but then I right. won it on appeal. 
And so now what does that tell people? Well, that there's probably a CIA black site in Morocco, even though I totally made it up and I've never been, I've been in Morocco, but it was before I was in the military. I loved it. So I choose places sometimes that I've been in the past. If I can't make it to that place for research for the particular novel and it happened to work geographically with what I wanted to happen. So I'd been to uh, Morocco, I'd been to Ukraine for that second one. So I was going to use that. And there was both, both times were before I was in the military, but, uh, so I don't think they liked that. So then when I sent in Savage Sun, they, uh, they, I forget how many redactions they, made, but, uh, the, a few. And then I appealed that one again, had my lawyers tie it, uh, every one of those to a publicly available government document. And then they wouldn't let me appeal. They said, they said, they said, no, even though we're within the timeline, totally by the book. No kidding. And so I took that as like my hint to like, Hey, stop yeah, bothering yeah. us with this fiction stuff. Uh, yeah. cause, we're, cause maybe we're going to have to let you win on an appeal, something that you made up that actually is true. So I was like, right. right. Yeah. So now I don't submit anymore because of that. So, Good. um, yeah. So Good. now I figure. Yeah, well, when you came out. out with Terminal List and you had the the redaction, it was new. Nobody had done it before. Yeah, in fiction. So yeah. it was, it, you know, we, yeah, in fiction. And we felt, as a reader, we felt like we were a part of something cool and covert and ninja, you know? And, and but it, you never tell the same joke twice, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, you right. Gotta, you got to come up with, with new things. So the way that it worked out has been, but that first one, that first one, hands down, that was the one thing that people, how I would when I would talk to people about it, I'm like, awesome characters and cool fight scenes and wicked awesome <laughs> violence. And there's redacted parts. And they're like, what? I'm like, I know, right? Yeah. You know, as civilians, well, all we know is redacted means, oh, wow. You know, it's same as when you guys, you know, when you black mask yeah, yeah. eyes out, right? Or whatever. So, yeah, that's, I think that's funny that you had to jump through those kind of hoops. I'm happy that you're not even feeling yeah, to deal with that crap I mean, anymore. Yeah, not, I'm far yeah, enough yeah. removed, especially those last couple when I'm researching uh, bioweapons and uh, bioweapons mm-hmm. research facilities, which I never set yeah. foot in or had a touch point with in the military. Right. And then for this this right. last one doing the uh, artificial intelligence and, oh. um, and quantum oh. computing stuff that I also did not have a touch point with in the military. So I don't want to let them redact things that I didn't learn from my time in uniform. It's right. just, it, it's, yep. just uh, it's just it's ridiculous, fiction. but uh, it's fiction. It's, it's uh, fiction with whispers of truth is how I, how I like to frame it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah. but that first one was, uh, was uh, really, you know, it was for a practical reason as well. That I kept those in there because when they came back, now you got to decide there's no directions. So mm-hmm. if you are to then change those sentences to something else, well, that's something that the government hasn't seen. So now do you need to resubmit those sentences? Yeah. Nothing tells you that. Right. That would make sense yeah. because yeah. now, I mean, what if you change it to something that is also should be redacted? But yeah. there's such, I don't know, I'm not looking at it there. Yeah. It's, it, yeah it's, take it's a, a deep breath. It's like trying to take argue with, breath. it's like trying to argue with why there's earthquakes. Like there's just some <laughs> things you just can't, it's just, it's like, oh, never mind. It, yeah, exactly. So now I'm just like, I, uh, <laughs> okay. there you go. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. So, and it all plays. Be kind of dumb animals. Uh, what's that? I said, be kind of dumb animals. That's oh. what's kept me out of jail for 40 years. <laughs> there you go. Hey, that's important. That is yeah. very, very yeah. important. The uh, interesting, yeah. it kind of ties over into the show. So the Terminalist show, uh, by the time this airs, it'll be out, uh, actually comes out tonight at, uh, at midnight Eastern time. Yeah. Um, yeah, it and, does. uh, it, it kind of ties in because we reached out and by we, I mean, the production reached out to the military. They have a, uh, off, oh, what is it like the public affairs office at the Pentagon, but they have a Hollywood <laughs> office to like help yeah, out. With movies, I saw like, active hour. I realized yeah, yeah, yeah. that they did. They mean, <laughs> I mean, they moved carrier battle groups around and they showed STVs. They, you know, uh, you know, it's, you know, I don't know how much, anyway, yeah, taxpayer dollars Anyways. went into moving those battle yeah. groups around. But uh, so the production reached out and was like, hey, we'd like to show, you know, maybe an Osprey or like, you know, something, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah. the Marine Corps got right back and was all in. They're like, yes, let's yeah. do it. Oh, and we're yeah. going to show some things that have never been shown on film before. Um, and it would have been pretty cool. But uh, then the Navy, uh, said no right away. And then the next day, the Marine Corps got, got back and was like, well, you know, they're the men's, men's department not. of the Navy. Uh, and, uh, they're like, well, we, you know, dad says no, essentially. Yeah, that's uh, so, right. Yeah. So they, yeah. so we couldn't use, uh, we're going to use Camp Pendleton and a couple, couple training areas and use some, some things that would have been pretty cool. But it, but it also, I like that because it kind of plays into bureaucracy. It plays into mm-hmm. senior level leadership. It plays into all the things that most of us at the tactical level despise anyway. So I heard that yep. and I was like, good. Cause I don't want good, any yeah. 
strings attached to anything we're doing. No, I don't want to don't want anybody coming their, back saying, yeah. remember when we did this for you? Or that, yeah, or that, or like, hey, we will let you do this, but you have to, let's say, right. not blow the Admiral, Admiral up in his yeah. office. Yeah, we yeah, need yeah, you no, to paint no, the military well, in a brighter light. Oh, and so yeah. I didn't want that to impact Pilsner doesn't process. get killed. There's a, there is no book if Pilsner doesn't get killed. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> it's pretty good. Way. I can't wait for you to see it. Yeah. It'll be out by, you yeah. know, you'll see it, you know, soon. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, they, they weren't thrilled with that, I don't think. Um, so, but back <laughs> I, in the day, I, wonder it, why. There's a, I mean, the great book, Kane Mutiny, Herman Woke. Um, it was, it was, it's a, such a fantastic book. It was a Broadway play afterward. And then obviously the movie with Humphrey Bogart, but the Navy made some significant changes required that they make some significant changes to that production back in the day. Um, which is surprising because if you watch it, it does not, it still does not show the Navy in a very positive light. If you remember life, Humphrey yeah. Bogart's character yep. and the strawberries yeah. and the whole thing. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's like, but I didn't want that to impact our, our show. You know, I want to have a complete, no, uh, no. complete creative freedom, but. Uh, and you guys yeah. have absolutely crushed it on every level. And again, this is, Anybody listening to this is going to say, well, Marcus, you know, you're on his show and you're a friend of his. Of course, you're going to sit there and say nice things. That's not necessarily true. I may not be as adamant about how positive it is. I might have a little little quieter, uh, constructive uh, criticism. But I've watched this growth from, from the book to when you announced to the filming and all the stuff that we were allowed to see. And you have taken it to such a... A, and I'm using the right word, awe, awe-inspiring level because you're setting the tone for so many other writers and so many other people that are going to talk about this subject. I mean, you set the bar really high and they just are going to have to rise up, but it's been a joy to watch this whole thing. And this whole backstory with Chris Pratt is like when I share that with other people, when they t- think about, like, there's a lot of people who are going to watch the show and then go read the book. And I you know, what can you do? As long as they're buying the book and watching the show, I don't care what order. But when I tell the backstory about Chris Pratt and you, you can see the eyes light up. And that's how I'm like, I don't have to say anything more. Everybody in the, in the film and the fact that you kept it as authentic as possible is like a, like a cherry on the, on the Sunday, but the you and the Chris Pratt and the background of that. And, and I believe Jared Jared Shaw, Shaw, Shaw. uh, you know, that, that trifecta right there is, is what makes it so sexy and so, so incredible. Oh, Anyways, man. I'll get off my, thank you. That's, thank you for my Ted talk. Ah, <laughs> thank you. No, it was, uh, we just actually filmed a, uh, a podcast, a terminalist podcast. We're doing a, so me and Jared and the showrunner, David DeGilio and a showrunner is like in a feature film is like the director is kind of the guy that's, that's, that's the singular point of contact. Okay. But in a series right. where you have multiple directors, you have a showrunner. Cause he has to juggle okay. the multiple directors. So he's like the right. singular point of contact, uh, executive right. producer, lead writer, all that sort of a thing for a show, yeah. for a series. Um, so we filmed okay. with me and Jared and David yesterday and uh, breaking down each episode. So for people that want to like behind the scenes and kind of get some backstory. Right. And so we, we did that the other day and Jared is just fantastic. It would not exist without him. And then this team yeah. we put together where we had this trust built from the very beginning with Chris and Antoine and David and Jared. And then we started building out the team from there and added Ray Mendoza from War Office Productions, who's a dear friend from the SEAL teams, Max Adams, Army Ranger in there in the writer's room, producer, second unit director there every single day on set to make sure that we stay rooted in a foundation that was, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that came from the novel and then also from real yep. life, you know? So we have all these guys yep. there that are personally invested because we're connected personally. It's not just a, it definitely wasn't just right. a job for for anybody no out there it was no it was pretty great definitely didn't give that impression no. yeah but we all learn new things on this podcast too so uh it's like i i, I learned things i'm like wait what no way like and Jer- jared said something and david and i had no idea but where a song came from that we uh, that that jared wanted in there and we put it in there but both of us had no idea really the backstory no. on it and it's pretty powerful really uh um, oh. yeah it was his death song like if he oh, died no overseas kidding. yeah no kidding that yeah, at his memorial oh. funeral. We're like, what? Anyway, wow. we got so, and, and every episode had Very something cool. like that. I was like, wait, what? You know, yeah. and I didn't know Tyna <laughs> Rushing, who plays Liz Riley, she took flying lessons. I'm like, I had no yeah. idea. Like, she I took just saw that lessons. today. You saw that? Yeah, I saw that something popped up on yeah. my phone on the way I was coming up here. And, but I found out about it yesterday uh, because they told me on the podcast we were doing. Like, we, you know, wow. this will drop a little later, but um, yeah, crazy, man. Crazy. But, uh, Dude, oh, speaking of reviews, real quick, before I want to jump yeah. back and, and ask you some things, but uh, speaking of negative reviews, so we had uh, 
film critics, they sent it out a week in advance or something, these screeners to, uh, to film critics. And, uh, a lot of them do not like it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> So I'm writing, you know, for me, Shocking. it's like, yeah, I'm like, hey, this was not made for New York and LA film critics. Uh, That's that right. Very, yeah. It's quite obvious. Yeah. And so I'm taking it as a good yeah. sign that those people don't yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, if they liked it, we'd have a problem. Yeah, exactly. If they were singing its praises, I'd be like, oh, yeah. man. Oh. But because we, they're we not, up. I'm like, it's for everybody in between LA and New York. Yeah. You know, it's for, yeah. this is definitely for uh, for the people. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, uh, yeah so, definitely. And I think yeah, we accomplished that's, that. I, that that's probably the best advertising you could get right now. Yeah, if you have people coming up being like, I'm from LA and New York. And I say, don't watch this. It's some kind of crazy right wing. Yeah. Whatever. You know, <laughs> people are going to be like, I don't know about the book. I don't know about the this, but I'm going to watch it for sure now. Oh yeah. One of them started with, uh, you know, Chris Pratt known for wearing don't tread on me t-shirts, which by the way, was the flag flown over every U S ship after nine 11 and on our shoulders right. going into combat. But regardless, anyway, they, they, so they put that in there as a negative and they say, and the author has a father's day gear guide with 13 guns and an American <laughs> flag cutting board, you know, like to set the tone for their negative review. Right. Like, hey, yeah. You're, yeah. you're not going to like it. This was not for you. <laughs> Like, yeah, you, know, you yeah. just wasted eight hours of your life. I hope you didn't watch the whole thing because right. you could have used those yeah. eight hours in another way to be a low, more yeah. productive, especially going in, knowing you're going to hate it. Uh, so yeah. well, anyway, yeah. that's, yeah, just- that's a fact. Yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not surprised though, but that yeah. is the, the negativity, uh, as we know, treads faster than mm, positivity. So, crazy. so that's the best marketing you're ever going to get. Hey, maybe yeah, it, yeah. They'll, they'll put, the, well, just think of it for, bear with me for a second. We have, three people who viewed it, two that are negative and one that's positive. And they put it out equally at the same amount of time on social media, mm-hmm. which is going to carry further in the algorithm, the negative or the positive. We know for a fact that the negative will, because wow. all negative stuff sells better. Jeez. So you guys could have saved millions of dollars in marketing by just letting them spew their nonsense. <laughs> and, and all the rest of us have been like, okay, that's a, that's a final final nail in the coffin. We are watching this for sure. And I'm going to buy all the books. Uh, Thank you very awesome. much. Yeah. That's kind of how I think of the negative reviews on Amazon. You know, a lot of those talking yeah. about gear or whatever, yeah. uh, those, those sell more books than the positive ones. I'm pretty. Early, oh, heck yeah. Certain. Yep. So, so I might keep oh, reading yeah, those negative it. ones for another, another no, few months, listen, you know, I will have somebody else read them then because yeah, you know what, send them to me. You know, as well as I do, what we take in is, is either, you know, I, I liken it to, um, to say arsenic. If I took a little sip of arsenic every day, yeah, it'd be bad for me, but it wouldn't kill me. Yeah. But if I took an, um, an abundance of it, it would eat my insides out, yeah. you know, and that's, and that you don't need that. You've got enough stuff in your world. The last thing you need is for some keyboard moron to be like, I felt that this was this, <laughs> you know what, go and uh, go and drink some Drano, buddy. Get out of here. I'm sorry. That was very nice, but go and find something else to, to yeah. do because you're, you're of no use. So I know. You just can't it was funny. It, uh, Again, yeah. don't tell the same joke though. Right. Well, don't you've done something. It's been original. It's been fun. Other people will steal the idea and now you've done it. Let somebody else go through it. I really you should be just looking for bomb threats. Anyways, the rest of them can go <laughs> pound sand. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. Lieutenant Commander James Reese, can you outline the details of your mission? This was a targeted attack. My timeline is a little fuzzy, but they knew we were coming. Headaches, paranoia, memory confusion. This is set up. Still think I'm losing my mind? It's David versus Goliath. Which one is Reese? David or Goliath? I'm still working that out. But I want to go back to the martial arts stuff for you, your okay. journey, because a lot of Let's it is, is similar to uh, to mine. So you're at that first martial arts school. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Kung Fu. Um, yep. And uh, and is any of it applicable or is it? Nothing. Uh, Absolutely so nothing. I got my ass kicked even more because I started doing it. Oh, man. Because you start sitting there being like, oh, yeah, you want some of this? And bang, bang, bang. Uh, Just, you know, yeah, no. 
Yeah. And my How neighborhood was it? not the best neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 let's see. I'd say, a, I'd say, 12, say three or four years. Yeah. Three okay. or four years. And then I, that's when I started to segue into the, to the wushu. Because I know for sure I was just about 16, 15, 14, 15, 16, I was doing wushu. And okay. that's when the second assault happened. But that's my, I know that that yeah so from about 10 to 16 i was heavily into shit that would never work in real life okay but <laughs> but you're getting maybe a little bit of a mindset you're getting your the door's been opened maybe balance yeah, flexibility yeah. coordination some well, of that, those sorts yeah. of things and and just enjoying life okay. when when if i like i think of it this way if if i was in a dark room all the time but for one or two hours a day i was able to open the door and the light would come in yeah. i'd really cherish those two hours mm-hmm. right and that's what martial arts was. Martial arts and comic books were the, those were my escapes. I was not athletically minded. I was not overly great in school at the, in the way that they wanted. You know, there was a lot of eh, not so great stuff, but the martial arts mm. was, that was, that was an escape and showing me that I could do something. And to be able to do a tornado kick or a spinning back kick, yeah. or whatever. like those are, those are metrics of accomplishments that will build an internal compass of, okay, I'm not, I'm not completely useless because I can do a tornado kick. Yeah, yeah. Who cares if I never do it in real life, but I can do it and you can't. So, yeah. Mm, oh, right. Man. And then when you get to the, the next, you find your next martial arts studio, uh, is any of that applicable or is it more applicable than what you were doing or, and did you mm, notice that? No, no. Well, the, so the wushu for sure was, it's just acrobatics, basically everything you see Jet Li using mm. and you're like, okay, yeah, I would never do that in real life. That's, that's, that's the stuff that was going on. A lot of aerial cartwheels and twists and turns. A lot of the stuff that you see stunt teams doing uh-huh. in the fight scenes now is considered a type of wushu. None of that was applicable. When I got into karate though, the Weichiru karate, um, again, I was not in the best place mentally and it, it was, it's a tough system. Like we did a lot of body conditioning and the, the expectation was to perfectly, perfect example, go to tournaments. Right. And we would do uh, semi-contact. And the deal was uh, if you knocked anybody out, you got a steak. Uh, if you got disqualified, you got free dinner. And it wasn't like Cobra Kai, like being malicious. We were just fight and do our thing. And if you couldn't handle a getting punched in the face, well then, Oh, boo hoo. And we would come in, it was like, we had our geese with the pants and the jacket and our belt. And we would just throw it over. No cup, no shin guards, no nothing. They, you know, they supplied the mitts and the headgear. And we just came in looking like hobos and just freight trains, just forward movement all the time, kill everything. It was, it sounds ridiculous, but it, mentally for me, it was a mm-hmm. really good time. And that's when I started like doing that. I was also starting my, my second career of bouncing, like, Mm. fitness training was my first career and then bouncing in nightclubs was my second career. And it really taught me quickly. Okay. That that's not going to work, Marcus, what you're doing, you need to sit there and you're going to, you're going to roundhouse kick that guy in the leg and it's going to drop him and you're going to go and do a, B and C. So my street fighting plus the, the, the weight you were karate really did merge a lot of the mindset into, okay. okay I know, I know for sure what isn't going to work. And I know now what is going to work. And it was, it was a great combination for me because the street fighting, you know, you've had your share of knuckle sandwiches, I'm sure. And given knuckle sandwiches and it's, it's a different, it's a different breathing apparatus when you're street fighting, you can't, you can't, you're going to find out real quick what you got and what you don't got. And back then it wasn't as bad as it is now. We were just seeing swarming starting to happen in my teen years, like the knockout game that they talk about then or now we were doing back then, you know, not as primal. Mm. I mean, you'd fight and you push and you punch and whatever. You got up and either you liked each other or you walked your separate ways. He didn't come back later and put two in the back of his head. You know what I mean? Like it was a different type of violence. And I'm thankful that I, I got to experience that versus now and the craziness we have now. Yeah. And then is it, yeah. is it after that where you go into a, you take a, another break and you, you try to describe it as the dark yeah. times before you go to Israel? Yeah. Is that, so yeah. what, what happens yeah. in those years? Well, uh, those year Logan was born in 97 and with his condition and all the stuff that happened with it, there was a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and a lot of anger inside. Yeah. And I was really angry with God. I thought that that I was being, that my son was punished because of me and all the negative things I'd done in my lifetime. 
So I was drinking a lot and, and, and just being a really, really shitty person, forgive my language. It was just, I was just not a good person. And then in 2005, three magical things happened. Uh, magical. I'm going to say my mom died. That wasn't magical, but I was able to tell my mom on her deathbed that I forgave her. Now I wasn't really telling the full truth, but I was able to let her die with some dignity. A little girl named Lincoln, I named her and she's the cousin of a, a child that I took care of as a, as a young man. And that was the second, my first birth was Logan. And that was not positive, right? I mean, you're, you've got a blue baby and all the stuff that goes with it. So my mindset to pregnancy and, and children was really, really dark. So when Lincoln was born, you know, I was able to pull her out and she was healthy and all my anxiety and fears were able to dissipate a little bit. And I was able to reset what having a child really was. And it was, it was positive. And she's not my child. I, I love her to death. I have her tattooed on my arm and I, I watch her and stalk her all the time, make sure she's healthy. But so she was born in 2005. My mom dies in 2005. And I get the opportunity to know what Krav Maga is. And from that, literally from January, well, say March, my mom died, March Lincoln was born. And then October, I was in Israel spending a month of, you know, October and in November of this, like, it, literally what I was made to do was to be understanding Krav Maga because I didn't have to worry about, you know, katas or anything. I was, I was dealing with knives and guns and multiple attackers and real violence and how to give real solutions. And I didn't even go, I didn't want to become an instructor. Like that's the ironic twist of all of this. I just went because I wasn't allowed to be a student. My guy, my instructor was like, look, we, we don't have any instructors in your part of Canada. So you got to come become an instructor and open up a chapter of, of our uh, federation. And that's, that's exactly what ended up happening. And I was really, really got bought into the, um, it's bigger than me type of situation, mm. you know, loyalty and being a part of a team and, and a lot of the stuff that goes with that. And from that, like, I, and then it was every year to get to grade, I went to a different place. Like I ended up going to Holland or I went to Hong Kong or I was in Texas a bunch of times, you know, that was my grading. And then in Israel, 2011, I got my equivalent of a black belt expert. And then I got an opportunity. They said, Hey, looks like you're a, a part of a team to teach. So get on a plane. And I ended up going to like the different countries and it just kind of went from there. Boom. How did you first Very find out about it? Crazy. Well, I went, the girl that I was dating at the time was a lot better on the internet than I was. And she, I was like, what about this Krav Maga stuff? Now, ironically, a childhood friend of mine, his brother converted to Judaism. And in 2000, I'll never forget this in 2000, when I was in a really bad place, he had messaged me and said, Hey, Marcus, you should try this Krav Maga stuff. It's an Israeli self-defense. And I was like, whatever. I was drunk, suicidal. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. But obviously, it was there. Mm. And then when we started looking for systems to train, because I didn't want to do what I was doing, she punched up Krav Maga. There was a school in, in a basically a 30-minute mm -hmm. place to get to. And I went. Now, I'd already owned my own martial arts studio. I've already been in martial arts my whole life. So I knew what I was looking for. And that wasn't it. But as a result of some weird events, I went home after three months. I'd go back and forth. I was getting in great shape, but it was just not for me. Mm. And so we How started come? punching what, what up Israel. That? Yeah, it was a different it was than what you cardio based. Uh, yeah, it was okay. all cardio based, right? Like it was it was 45 minutes of kickboxing and 10 minutes of whatever this Krav Maga stuff was. Uh, so I would come back in March okay. again. So many things happened in 2005. March, I came, like, I would come home every night. In March, I finally said, that's it. I'm not going back anymore. No. And so she punched up, and she saw that that school had nothing to do with Israel. And because I'm a traditionalist, you know, you can't, you can't be in martial arts and not have a little bit of traditionalism in you. I wanted to be a part of Israel because I wanted to do Krav Maga. Yeah. And then punched in the federation that I became a part of. Went to San Diego to do a seminar. Okay. Saw what real Krav Maga was about, training okay. in 100-degree weather, and watching, oh my goodness, this is, wow. Okay. And then he just said, hey, you're the guy that handles Canada is going to be in Montreal in July. Like <laughs> the time frame on this is really trippy. Like, yeah. you know, June, I'm, June I'm, in, I'm in San Diego. March, I quit. June, I'm in San Diego. In July, I contact my guy. In August, I'm in Montreal. We talk for five minutes. 
And then in October, I'm in Israel. And it just was whirlwind, boom, 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 boom. And you can't tell me that whatever you believe in didn't step in. Like, no matter what, you can say whatever you believe. I, the way that things happen, there's no logical way that any of this happened yeah. except for fate. You can't. Man. And so do you know like where you're going to live? Do you have an apartment? Are you like in a barracks? Are you like, well, he, how, how all he work? said was, he said, uh, you'll stay in my house. Wow. I have a room for you and you'll stay in my house. And ironically that, that room ended up being, you know, whenever I came into country, that was my room and I would no stay there. And then I lived like I lived in Israel for a year, several years after that in about 2014, I, st- I lived there for a year to convert to, I basically upgraded my team. So I would, I was in like the B team and then I, 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 I tested and trained so I could get up to the A team, the tier, the tier one of it. And living in Israel is, I mean, if I didn't marry my second wife, I'd, I'd be living in Israel. Still there. I would have shacked up. I would have shacked up, converted all of that because I love the country. Yeah, I, I do. I, I love it. It's, it's a second home aside from America. I, I love Israel. Man, it's that's beautiful. The, that's Which is why the book has been so oh, exciting for man. me. Man, I mean, that's why the, uh, man, I really wanted to go there for this book for research. But this is right. COVID and it was shut yep. down, shut down, shut down. Oh, it was like yeah, open for a day and then it was shut down again. Yeah. And then it was only Israeli yeah. citizens. And then, so yeah. it was like, there was no uh, practical it was way impossible. to get over no. there during this last year. No. Um, so, I mean, I've always been fascinated by, by Israel and have wanted to go for so long. I have many friends over there. Um, and so yeah. what I did is I wrote those chapters, did all that research, wrote those chapters. Right. And then I sent it to my friend in Israel, uh, Gavi, who's mm-hmm. been on the podcast before. And, uh, yeah. and he gave it to three generations in his family. So three generations. Oh, nice. It, and they all okay. came back and they said, I cannot believe that he has not set foot in Israel with this chapter. From That's the amazing. To the really? cigarettes, to the yeah. beer, to the, oh, yeah. the war the memorials, coffee. you know, the time it takes to get from place to place, describing yeah. how, how it looks. Um, so that made me. I, I was like, okay. So that made me feel really good. I, I mean, I feel bad yeah. that I didn't get to go there because those chapters I'm right. sure would be a little different. Um, had I actually gone yeah. there and stood in some of those yeah. places and got those of smells course. and, you know, had the food yeah. and the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. they would for sure have been different, but, uh, but I loved writing that. I loved doing the research yeah. and I loved sending it over to Israel and being like, Oh man, I wonder what they're going to say. Uh, right. And yeah. then, uh, the best, I mean, this was really cool though. I don't think I've ever said, but, uh, Ron Cohen, CEO of SIG. I mean, I have such yeah. respect for, for him. He's an amazing person. Um, but I was a little nervous because of, oh, people, people can go right? online and check out his background and you know, I won't go yeah. into it. But uh, yeah. I was a little nervous what he was going to think of this because he loves the novels. And yeah. this one, though, has the Israel touch point. And I was like, oh, oh yeah. And he's not going to pull any punches. Like, no, he was right. going to let me know. And, uh, yeah. and he also writes very short texts. He's a very busy person, you know. Yeah. And I got this amazing long text from him that I, it's just really, and, uh, and he loved it. And, uh, I was so appreciative of the way I captured Israel. And I was like, yes, Uh, that's the one I was worried about. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. Yeah. But, uh, and it was really meant a lot to me that he would take the time as busy as he is, you know, doing the things he does to write more than three letters. Yes. Yeah. That was really, really special to me. But, uh, but yeah, uh, I wish I could have gotten over there. So Israel will make an appearance. I am sure in a future novel because I need to get over there, but, uh, yes, you do. Yeah. (laughs) So that first 30 days that you go over there, um, you, you haven't been there before, uh, you're staying in someone's room in their house. And, uh, and so what is it like you land and then what do you do? Does he pick you up? Do you have to figure out how to like, how to get in a cab and then what city are you in? Where are you? Where do you land? Well, I landed in Tel Aviv and, uh, and he picked me up, but ironically I land just before Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Now, for those that don't know, when Yom Kippur hits, the entire country shuts down. All the, there's no driving cars. Like the, for 24 hours, the entire there's nothing. No planes, no nothing. And had I landed just a little later, Avi, my instructor, wouldn't have been able to come into the airport and scoop me up. Oh. And so now I didn't understand the full significant, significance of that until we drove back to his place. And he was about 30 minutes. Everything's, I mean, Israel, you designed it perfectly in in the book. Like it's four hours all the way around without traffic. You know, it's small. But when I went to sleep, I woke up 
like in, you know, I'm jet lagged. I'd never traveled internationally ever before. I'd never even traveled. So my first real trip is Israel way, way too much for over sensory overload. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, we're, we're going out and I'm, we're walking on freeways. I'm like, um, there's kids playing, riding bikes because there is no cars except for security. Right. That's the only, all you see is blue lights and they run their lights all the time. They don't shut them off. They were running all the time and there's kids playing and everything. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. And then at 4 30 AM, I hear traffic like bustling tra- traffic. It's been dead quiet the whole time I've been there. Mm-hmm. And then waking up at 4 35 o'clock in the morning, and trucks are going, cause it's back to work time. Mm-hmm. Like young Kapoor is great, but it's time to work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and just the food and, and the culture and, I learned very quickly that if you don't say what you mean quickly, the Israelis will be like, I got no time for you. Interesting. Because, right? And that's the reason why you get quick texts. Ah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here. The answer is yes, no, maybe. Like, it's, it, we don't have time for this. We right. got to get moving. We got to come on. We got lots going on. Yeah. Uh, and it's so small. Like, the cars that we have in America are like, you can always tell when somebody shipped one over because you're like, how do you, you can't drive that. There's no drive through banks, no drive through restaurants. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an amazing culture. It, it really is an amazing culture. And so I, and then we trained every day. We got up at eight, we trained all day long and I'm getting hammered with information. Yeah. Okay. Bombarded. And I tell this story because it's an important one. The first two days I, I just shut down. Like now you could give me the, well, yeah, jet lag and whatever, but I had a, I had a break through breakdown mm-hmm. i was in tears i wasn't getting the movements and he uh he comes out he goes okay my instructor says we're gonna take a break have a coffee and i'm and i look later on at my notebook and you i can't even read it's it yeah. looks like sanskrit on seizure medicines yeah. and i can see where the tears were wow. where i was crying and we we're doing knife defenses i just wasn't getting it huh. and he comes out he goes hey let's go and I'm like, okay, I'm ready. And all I see is the gleaming of the silver and it's a real knife. And he comes down and stabs at me. I block, I freak out. I hit him in the mouth. I barely kicked him in the balls. Like I barely missed his balls. And I scream at the top of my lungs. What the blank is wrong with you? Mm. He looks over and he goes, see, you know it. <laughs> That's like out of a movie. That's fantastic. I'm telling you, and, and, and the reason I bring that up is because it greatly impacted how I teach mm. from that point on. I'll remember that. I remember need, that. right. I need, I need people to see under stress that you can do it because when fear and insecurity come through, which they will, if you don't really subconsciously believe in what you're doing, it's going to manifest at the worst time. So I mm. need you to know that worst case scenario, you can do what I need you to do when I need you to do it. Yeah. And then from there 30 days and then I, I tested at the end of 30 days and it was the, the testing board was him and another guy who was very famous at uh, God guy. And so two guys staring at me and there's it. What it reminds me of is when you guys would go to the board, uh-huh. when you guys had finished doing everything yeah, yeah. and just before you, right. And, and they would jump. hammer you with, yeah, Oof. that's exactly what it felt. Only two men and they're Israeli. And it was, it was, man, it was, it was. And then, Basically, I stayed at a, a hotel because after the hotel, I, he picked me up. I went to an airport because we were training in a different location. And then on the way back, I just, I, it just never really hit me for, you know, probably two or three years, the magnitude of what I had just experienced because mm-hmm. I took it for granted because I just assumed this is what you do. Yeah. You come over, you get your ass kicked for 30 days, and here you go, pass or fail. Okay. But it wasn't, it was a, a magnificent, one-off situation that I will cherish till my last breath. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So 30 yeah. days, you're totally 30 immersed. Days. Uh, then oh, you come Lord. home and you start teaching. Uh, now you yep, have a, sw- a certification and you're still in Canada. Yep. But you're, oh, yeah, are you're still teaching in Canada. in Canada and you're traveling or how does that work? Yep. No, I was at that time, I was just trying to teach and I was still doing personal training, still working in bars. And I was trying to grow our federation in Canada. So okay. my responsibility was to try to grow it and have instructor courses. And it was really tough for a couple of years because it's, it's Canada. And we were having legal issues with mm. the name Krav Maga uh, due to some political bullshit that was going on. And blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And so we have two years. And, and in those two years of, or three years, I traveled once a year to go get graded and tested. Um, then I would come back and just live my life to the best I could. And it really just kind of changed everything around 2010. 
uh, I was in Hong Kong with my instructor doing a test and he knew that my next year I would be going only to Israel to test from then on out. Mm. So we were having some really hard testing and I was getting hammered by six or seven people. And he said something that I really, I really resonated. He said, Marcus, when you think you suck, when you have time to think you, you screw it up left, right and center. He goes, but if I throw five people at you attacking you and knives and guns, he said, you perform perfectly. Mm. He said, don't think just listen to you in here and react to whatever comes your way. Don't think about it. And that, that has set the tone from that. That was 2010 to now. I don't, I go with my gut and I react to whatever is coming to me. And the more I think about it, the worse it gets. I just yeah. have to have faith in the situation and go. And that's where, when I moved there in 2013 was because I was in such a bad place in Canada. Canada's like, aside from my son, there's nothing for me in Canada. I have friends. I love them, but there's nothing there. And him being him, he, he just said, look, come back home stay here for a year and let's just see where it goes. And I was already doing a little bit of traveling for work, but from there I would just leave Israel, go do things, come back training every day. And then we had a test for my next to, to level up. And he said, yep, you're ready. And so I became part of what we called the global team, which is in retrospect, it would be kind of like, team six right like you're you're at the tip of the spear i'm the only non-israeli on the team that's wild um yeah yeah that that is really something that i i felt very good about yeah. that because the israelis have as you know <laughs> they don't pull any punches if you don't they don't like something they'll be more than happy to let you know they don't like it wow um so i was welcomed and then and then it just i was in countries left right and center yeah. boom 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 i was working three weeks a month all for like several years Man, and that year that you're uh, in israel you're coming and going from there at the same time or are you just yeah. immersed? okay so you're coming yeah. and going from israel yeah. and, the, and you're yeah. still training make working your I'm way up to that training. next level uh, yeah. you're, you're still in the guy's yeah. uh the guy's guest room yep still in the guest yep. room that was my room nice. yep so that was my room nice. and so uh, for a full year you're over there man did anything yeah. happen like while you were there any uh uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Su suicide we bombing wars type things while we're over there. That, uh, oh yeah. 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 That, uh, that iron dome was, was, was not new, but it really been, it had earned its money. Wow. Uh, we're sirens were going on uh, all the time. And at that time, myself and a teammate, who's really the closest thing I have to a brother, we were formulating a course, uh, that, that basically was because every one of our courses that we teach is something to do with specific, like whether it's civilians or you're working with law enforcement mm. or SWAT, there's a specific thing for SWAT VIP. And we have a military one because it's based on a military mm. system. But what we didn't have was one to get people prepared to, to work with elite units. Mm. Cause just working with the Navy is one thing. Working with team guys is a different mm. thing, right? Yeah. So we formulated this course and we had to map it out and lots uh -huh. of hiking, lots of, it was 10 days. We had a selection situation. We started with 40, ended the course with 10. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was, it was, and to, but to do the course, we had to map everything out. And that was such a, we hiked, you know, 20, 30 clicks a, a day, packs, you know, going through rough camping. I mean, it was, that time in Israel was something that I, aside from the Krav Maga aspect, yeah. living in Israel and being around it. And I, I mean, everyone sp speaks English, but you know, you just immerse with the language and, yeah. you know, people ask, can I speak Hebrew? I can't speak it, but I sure can understand a lot yeah, more than yeah. I'll let on about, you know, <laughs> it's, you, know you gotta, you gotta know when somebody's talking crap about you. <laughs> um, and then being around the border and all the, what, what people think forget about is that Israel is surrounded by people that hate them. Yeah. And you need to understand that because it's, it's, it's everywhere. You have Arab Israelis, you have uh, Israelis, you have Arabs all around you, you have workers. I mean, and, and at any given time, there are stabbings all the time. You know, the, the hatred towards Israel is a real thing and, and people need to be mindful of it. Now, does that mean that every Muslim person hates Israelis? No, but you better be mindful of the fact that there's a conflict for a reason. So when you have sirens going on a regular basis and, you know, perfect example, we were in a location scouting out a place. We drove 10 minutes later, we get the, the alert on it. Boom. That place is gone. 
Jeez. we're maybe 15 minutes, 15 minutes out, yeah. Jeez. you know, yeah. one thing that Israel about being in Israel that I learned very quickly is appreciate your day because it can be taken like that. Yep. And as soon as I landed the first time in 2005 to any time I've been there, I came to peace with, if this is my time, then I'm going to, I'm going to just embrace what I got right now right. and living in the moment in Israel. You have to, you can't think too far ahead. You have to, you, you think with your eye on the future, but you don't necessarily think too much about it. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, this last book, yeah. I, I've always thought a lot about time, but I wove that into this, uh, this last novel, but I mean, you, you don't, you don't know how much time you have. You have one ride and you don't know how long it's going to last. Yep. So then you exactly. get to decide how you're going to spend that time and how you're going to influence people around you, how you're going to impact them. You get to choose if it's negative yes. or positive. Um, yes. But uh, if you don't think about it, if you don't internalize that and you're just going from one tweet or meme to the next, yeah, you know, it's, no, uh, yeah. it, it's tough. There's so many distractions out there, especially for kids. Yeah. You need to take that time and breathe. You need to take that time and go into a martial arts school, yeah. do your jujitsu, do whatever yeah. you're going to do, yeah. but there's not a phone yeah. in your hand and you're testing yourself Yo. or some sort of a crucible yeah. involved. Um, yeah, that stuff is so important, but, uh, they don't man. understand the word regret, yeah. right? Children don't understand the word regret. And it's us as adults that really, we, we don't understand it until we've had significant loss in our life or we're about to be gone. Yeah. That's when the regret really comes in. Right. And now nobody's even holding people accountable. I can't, nobody comes up and says, Hey, Marcus, you know, you're, you're, you're slacking, man. You need to get up off your ass and remember tomorrow could be gone. Yeah. Like no we don't guarantee. have anybody that just shakes us anymore. There's no guarantee, you know, it's a, no, except that we're going to be gone. That's yeah. the one guarantee. We're going to be dead. No, at some no point. guarantee no, that no you're going to be here tomorrow is the, is the, no. uh, is what I was, what I was getting at. Oh man. Yeah. It's God. a true story. Man, it's yeah. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, so we're going back to the crab maga, uh, is it mega or maga. How do you say it? Crab maga. Crab maga. Crab maga. Crab maga. Crab maga. Yep. Go, say, put the yep. right emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, we had a decision to make in the early, uh, days of filming. And, uh, that was, and it wasn't a hard decision to make, but you know, you had to think about it for a second. And that was, uh, Hey, are we going to choreograph these fight scenes in a way that is like ballet, you know, and that like John Wick type right. style where everything yeah. is, I mean, it yeah. looks amazing and all this stuff, yeah, but yeah, yeah. not like a real fight, obviously. Um, no, not at all, yeah. <laughs> but still visually appealing to an audience. Still visually um, impactful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so it didn't take, you know, we were like, yeah, we're not doing that. Um, so I'm right. very curious to, uh, to hear what you think of these, of these fight scenes. Um, cause the intent of all of them was, uh, you know, if, if you, like, if I was to walk outside this door, or, you know, walk outside and right. then just get tackled by somebody yep. out of the shadows, like yeah. what's going on? What do I do next? Um, right. yep. know, so it's like that kind of a fight. So we tried, that's what we tried to capture, um, in these nice. things. So particularly in that first episode, um, because there's a knife involved and, and there's firearms involved. So I think that's the one that you, you will probably identify with, uh, the most. So, um, yeah. so I'm curious to see what you, you think, uh, about it. Yeah. You know? Um, there's Hollywood yeah. aspects to, you know, to everything. It's a Hollywood you know, it, well, it has but, to, you know, but we did do, uh, try to make best efforts. There's one particular thing with a pistol. That's pretty cool. That, uh, you'll, that you'll nice. notice that, uh, that I'm happens. So, excited. um, yeah, I'm curious to see what you, what you think. Cause it has, it has yeah. all those well, things. Don't be surprised. You get a text message. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully tonight, hopefully tonight or tomorrow. Yeah. Um, yeah. especially yeah. cause it's the first episode, but, uh, yeah. Cause you, you're incorporating all those things, you know, primal visceral violence, um, yeah. Yeah, foundational and you're throwing a firearm in there or two firearms in there and you have a blade in there. Um, and it's a surprise, like all those things, like all those elements, mm -hmm. uh, come, yeah. come together yeah. there. So I'm curious, uh, as to, as to what you're going to, what you're going to think of it. But, uh, so, so you're in Israel, you do this year of, of yep. training and traveling, yep. uh, have this incredible experience. And then is it for the next up until just recently that you were continuing on that path, traveling yeah. around the world yeah. and traveling different places yeah. in this country? Yeah. I, uh, so after I did my year, then I, uh, I, I married my second wife and we, uh, and we moved to Texas and, and during that time, well, not for the first year because immigration doesn't want you to travel for a year or work at all. So after that year of punishment was done, I had to make up for lost time. And then I was on a plane. DFW was my second home. Like I, I was every country for like sometimes a month or six weeks at a time, various countries going to different places. Um, which, you know, is, it sounds sexy, but as you know, it's venue, hotel, mm -hmm. venue, hotel, mm -hmm. airport, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not oh, yeah. what it, it's cracked up to be, but it was still a, 
it was a good experience for me because of the interactions I would have with people like doing a workshop or a seminar. It's very much like in many ways, it's very much like how you do your book tours. You go, you talk a little bit, you get some interaction and then you get the people to sit there and you feed off of the people Mm -hmm. of what they really want to do or whatever. Um, or have whatever their opinions are or thoughts. And that's where the juice starts flowing, right? You start getting your real, real feedback and, and back and forth. Those were fun, right? Teaching is teaching. It's, it's good. But the, the interactions, different cultures, different beliefs, it's, it's been a, it was a great ride. But at some point in time, COVID was a blessing for me mm. because I knew, I knew that I was, I was done. I knew yeah. that I was, I was t- tired. I'd burn out. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm the victim of my own situation. I have put myself in a box. I spent 16 years being the Krav Maga guy and this is me. And here I am now where I'm like, well, you know, but I've, I'm a lot more than just a Krav Maga guy. I've got 50 plus years of life experience of, of the reasons why I'm good at what I do and how I do it. So I'm now kind of trying to find a way to, to express myself without being in that box. Mm. Like, and I, and I, I use you as a very good example. Jack Carr, you can say Jack Carr, Navy SEAL. Yep. That's a factor. Jack Carr, the author. Yep. That's a factor. But you're a husband, you're a father, you're a son, you, you know, you're a friend, you're a brother. You, you've got so many aspects of it to put you as just one thing does a disservice to all the other things that make you the person that you are. And so where I find conflict is, you know, what people want to talk about, what they don't want to talk about. You know, I get that, you know, you want to talk about this, but I'm, I'm me. I, I, I have a lot of other stuff that, that, that I want to talk about. And I get that mostly when I'm interacting with people on a local level, right? They're like, hey, you're that crop guy guy. Yeah, well, I'm also a guy who loves coffee or a <laughs> guy who will kill a steak in a heartbeat. You give me, give me one of those half face blade steak knives and I'll <laughs> nice little plug in there. there you yeah. Go, yeah. Yeah. No, nice. you know, I love Andy. Yeah. yeah uh, great guy. You know, so I have a variety of other things. And I think that that's the important part is I'm not in a box, yeah. just like you're not in a box. Most people aren't, Yeah. you know? So, yeah. so how do so, you, have you, uh, what, what are you doing now then? What are you, uh, that's a, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> um, I'm doing nothing. I am doing nothing. I have, I've been praying every day, like, okay, what, what's my pe- purpose? So all I've been doing is writing some articles, which again, people are going to be so tired of this. And I'm sure you are already, but I've, and I've messaged you and I've told you that whenever I'm having creative issues, like I have to listen to something. And usually it's usually terminal list is what kind of gets me going or savage son. Those are the two that I, 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 I go to a lot. But I'm writing a lot of articles for Skillset Magazine. Mm-hmm. And, and Ben's been a, just a blessing to be like, look, right. man, I know you're retired. You got nothing going on. I got a few clients here or there. Okay, here, write some articles. And it's been, it's been very uncomfortable for me mm-hmm. because I, and writing is not, you know, it's not my mm-hmm. strong suit. So having those opportunities until the next thing comes by, which I don't know what it'll be, but whatever it'll be. I'm back in Texas and that's kind of, for me is the, the blessing. I loved Arizona. It was great. I loved it, but Texas is home and okay. it will, and I will take my last breath on Texas soil. So I'm not sure what I'm going to end up doing from that aspect, but whatever it is, it'll be fun and exciting. Wow. So are you still training personally then? Are you still keeping, yeah. uh, is that well, daily I'm, or how does, what's I, your, what's your, what's your weekly I'm, training uh, regimen look like? Yeah. You know, a lot of things have, have downplayed. I do so much body weight stuff because, you know, as much as I love cleans and kettlebells and all that, it's great. You know, you have to have a certain mentality for that. And I'm trying to just walk this next chapter of my life. So I do great five, eight mile walks in a park with trees and water. And I know you're always walking, to, you're, you're always walking yeah. when you're, when you're sending me a text or a, uh, yeah. or a video or when you're putting, th- putting something on, uh, on the social channels, like where's he walking? Yeah. He's always walking. What's he doing? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the only way I get my creativity. Mm. It's, it's the only way I truly can spark it And four walls will drive me mental. Like oh, I wow. just, I, 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 right. Unless I'm focused on something, unless I have to focus on something. Yeah. Um, so, and so, you know, body weight, if there's a bar and I can, grab and do a pull up here and there. 
I take the Rocky Balboa approach. If I can go by and I can pull off four or yeah. five, I'm pretty happy about nice. it. Nice. Okay. Know? <laughs> yeah. I got to do that too. I'm putting in a little out, so, uh, Rocky Four gym outside. Um, Are just, you? Uh, yeah. So just, uh, you know, just putting some poles in the ground and, and putting the bar up there and putting the, the Sornex off the grid rack on there and a little, little bench nice. and a tire and a sledge and just... Uh, you know, so I can walk out of the podcast studio, which is should be f- done in a couple of days here, and I can walk outside, and it's right there, and uh, nice. You know, it's outside, and I like that. And so, um, yeah, it's time. I prioritized everything else above uh, uh, staying in shape, eat, eating right, and getting sleep over the last few years. But uh, yeah. before it catches up to me too much more, I need to uh, yeah. work on the the schedule and the priorities and get more effective and efficient yeah. with things. That's what this year is yeah. really um, is really about. I'm focused on book six right now. I have a couple other Hollywood projects in the hopper, and uh, then it's getting effective and efficient with some of these other things so that I can focus on the creative endeavors and maybe take a little better care of myself, get a little sleep, eat something besides yeah. Fruit Loops, pretzels, and uh, doctor washing it down with Dr. Pepper, which is essentially my fuel as I write. Um, you know, it's just how it is. But, uh, you know, you got to prioritize uh, things. You only have, like we talked about, you only have so much time. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so yeah. I had to, you know, you got you to prioritize your your efforts. Um, and it's always yeah. moving. You know, it's always a, a full-on sprint. But, oh, interesting, going back to time for a second. Time is you know, something that I'm a watch person and I just, uh, I've always, I've thought about time since I was a little kid, but, uh, when we're talking about social media and time and guarantees, um, it's interesting that I don't think it might be wrong that anybody's ever been on their deathbed saying, I wish I would left that one last negative Amazon review. I wish yeah. I'd made one more yeah. negative comment on that post. Yeah. If only yeah. I had more time, that's what I would do. Yeah. I'm yeah. pretty sure. Maybe, maybe there are people yeah. out there. Uh, well, no, know. I'm not saying it's impossible. Yeah, exactly. I'm not. Uh, right. I feel but it's highly it's unlikely. Highly unlikely. No, nope, that's true. Every single one of them is. I wish I had more time with my kids. I wish I had taken better care of myself. Top two, top two. Yeah. Nobody's ever sat there and said, you know, when well, money always comes into it, but it's never, I wish I had made more for me. Mm. Right. Like I never, I've never, I've been a lot of deathbeds and every single one of them has been, I wish I had been a better uh, spouse, better parent, and I wish I had taken better care of myself. Those are the three that guaranteed, guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And we're and we, you know, I'm 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 a bit older than you, but at the end of the day, it's not impossible to to alter the ending, mm-hmm. right? Whatever the next book is for, and not your books, but book of life, mm-hmm. it's not impossible. I've been around way too many. Uh, uh, adaptive athletes and people who are in their forties and fifties who are absolutely crushed in this stage of their life. And they've said the same thing to me. I'm so happy. I became handicapped, which, which is mind boggling to me. And they're like, yeah, because if I hadn't, I would have just pissed away my entire life and I wouldn't have done the things that I've done. I'm like, wow. well, talk about perspective yeah. or perspective, whatever the word is. Mm-hmm. I think I always had a silent S in that one for some reason, <laughs> but it's true. It's very yeah. true. You, you, you can't, until something's taken from us, we never appreciate it. I know. Could you include freedom? I'm looking at Canada right now. I'm looking, and I love Canada, okay? It is a place I've been born. I will always love Canada. I've never been more ashamed and upset at it. my country. I, I looked at Australia, and I was like, ah, you guys, what's wrong with you guys? I used to love coming to your country. And then I look at Canada, I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Yeah. And then, you know, watch, watch what you ask for. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Giving up some things that uh, that people sacrificed everything uh, for. Uh, yeah, and people, it. there's men and women rolling in their graves right now. Yeah. Now, if they could pop up and have, I would love for them to pop up and give everyone a good slap in the face. <laughs> I didn't die I for know. this. I know it's like you know, there's no new world to get in a boat and sail towards. We're already there, so it's uh, we're already it puts there. Us in a bad spot, if you, because <laughs> uh, I'd probably yeah. be, I'd probably be on the open ocean right now, headed uh, headed somewhere where, uh, a little more free. If that makes yeah, sense, but yeah, maybe. yeah, of course. Oh man, but uh, yeah, man. And, and so, how many times did you come out here to uh, the National Ability Center in in Park City? Okay, so, right. So that's the the weird. So I had set up an arrangement with them, and it didn't actually come through. Uh, but you I worked, worked with adaptive athletes somewhere else then. I did, yeah. yeah, in Missouri. Okay, and from that, when we had talked, and you would, were going to do some work, or you did work with them. Um, we had chatted and then like COVID and a whole bunch of things yeah, had yeah. kicked in. So what I'm, what I've done is I've just kind of th- like I do with everything. I just cast lines, right? I just, Hey, 
how you doing? Remember that time we talked over here or whatever? Working with adaptive people in general, whether they're athletes or they're, they're just normal, regular people, uh, working with them has been a godsend. Yeah. I'm going to Minnesota in September, and it's only reason I'm going is a group in Minnesota has said, look, we're going to do the same thing you did in Missouri or any other center. We're going to have you come by. I'm going to do two workshops, one that I did for general, just general everybody with a whole mm-hmm. bunch of stuff. And then we're also going to do something with uh, somebody who's working with the deaf community. So we're going to work with hearing impaired wow. people because, I mean, at the end of the day, that I can't, I personally can't fathom my hearing is already shot, mm-hmm. right? There's enough to make this to last a lifetime. So when it goes, I'm, I'm, I can't imagine living my whole life not being able to hear my surroundings, yeah. you know, and especially for those men and women who have, they were raised hearing and then they lost their hearing yeah. at a certain age. I mean, if you're born, born deaf or born blind or born, I mean, you adapt and improvise, you, you, you survive and thrive. But when you're it's taken from you as a, as a young adult or an adult, I, I don't know how I would cope with that quite honestly, especially blindness or anything that makes me feel vulnerable. Ooh. So I have a huge amount of, of, of respect. And I just want to give, I just want to level the playing field a little bit. Um, I can teach anybody to be violent, like give violent solutions in 10 minutes. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot to be violent. It's your head that you got to clear up. If you can be violent to a bad guy and run away or get away, that's 90%, 95% of the battle. Yeah. A lot of times they just want to know what to do. Okay, here you go. Bing, bing, bing. Five seconds. Done. It's easy. I'd rather it's not hard to be violent. Avoid these days, you know, and well, but be prepared. And that be prepared. How? Well, you know, and this is the one thing where, and I get a lot of flack from the the tactical community because I the things I say piss off a lot of people. I'm like, you know, you got a, you got your your pistol, you got your mag, you got your knife, you got your flashlight, you got your everything. When really, what do you need? You need a tourniquet, mm, yeah. right? You need some form yeah. of first aid and something that might be a force multiplier if you need to, but for the most part, you need your eyes and your ears. Open those up and see the problems that are going on. Oh yeah. Pick that head up. If I took... Be aware. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I took... You and I were walking down the street. We're like having coffee and everything's good. And we see two dogs growling at us. Are are Jack and Moore going to walk up and be like, (laughs) hi guys? We would never do it. And no, no rational minded person would ever do it. So then why can't you take the same thing when it comes to the idea of violence? You think something's not right? Go the opposite direction. Yeah. It's not rocket science. Yeah. Maybe there's a little ego in there, especially when you're younger. But uh, oh, oh, yeah. like, oh, Army Special I Forces uh, sniper told me years and years ago, he said, if it just doesn't look right, it's not. And so, it, yes. And so JDLR just doesn't look right. And so I pass that yep. along. I pass that along to everybody yes. in the SEAL teams I've ever worked with, pass it along to my, my yep. wife and kids, you know, yep. trust that instinct. We're here because we had yep. ancestors that trusted theirs. Oh, uh, we're also here yeah. because we had ancestors that were good at the hunting and the fighting. Um, for yes. only a very slim portion of human history, have we been able to stumble through life oblivious to be, uh, <laughs> to what's going on around us. And maybe, yeah. you, maybe you get out the other side. Okay. Maybe not, yeah. but in the I'll past, you would not, you would not survive. No. Um, only a no. certain amount of time where you could dial nine one one. You could outsource your protection, oh. or you could feel yeah. like you're outsourcing your protection because yeah. nine one one exists. Yeah. Um, because you're in yeah. a civilized society, you outsource yeah. the people that fight for you, uh, and outsource yeah. the people that produce your food because it's always going to be down there yeah. at the at the grocery store until it's not. Yeah, and that is the no. very slim no. portion of human history that we're living in right now where you can be comfortable and perhaps survive. Um, but uh, the but the goal, as I always say, is not. It's not survival. It's not to survive a fight. It's not to just to survive in life. It's to prevail. It is to prevail. Yep. There's a difference. There's a different yep. mindset just to, between oh. survival and prevailing. Yeah. Um, so yep. I always, uh, always think about that. But it just doesn't look right. I mean, trust it. If it doesn't look right, yep. don't push through. Yep. Don't push past nope. it. Don't make excuses nope. to push past it. Just It just doesn't look right. Boom. It just Go doesn't on. look right. Go and, and, be, and, be, and you have options. Go another direction. Nothing you have is over there that's worth you losing your life over or, or some event happening that will completely alter you and your family's life for, forever. Yeah. You're, you think your child gives a crap about you walking towards violence because you're some kind of something? No, Turn that around. kid doesn't want to see you in toots. Mm-hmm. You know, 
turn it um, around and get out of it. And there. this is why, and I think this is why women live longer than men, quite honestly, because when they, if they're with their child, they will listen to that, that trigger. Interesting. Now, when they're by themselves, a lot of times they don't. Interesting. But they still will, they will still, because of how they're raised, they still, they know what violence looks like. Men, we're arrogant. We're like, nah, I, I can do this or whatever. And that's how you end up, you know, with a hole in your body or multiple holes in your bodies because you didn't listen to the fact that big don't go there. Right. So. Right. Oftentimes beings, there are man. signs. Oftentimes there are signs. And when they're not signs, there are feelings. There's a sixth sense. Yes. It's a real thing. There's yep. an intuition. There's it's a an real instinct. Um, yep. And you better listen to it because yep. it's our ancestors. Or, or bad did. things are going to happen to you. Yeah. And, 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 and I always say this to parents. Okay, let's say you did get unscathed about it. Let's just say you were able to do, do everything right and you didn't listen to it and you dived in there. What about your child? You can't fight properly when you're worried about a liability. You can't. It's yeah. not possible to sit there and focus and know that that child's flailing in the wind, just kind of, and you, you know, so now the child's hurt or traumatized. Thanks, parent. Yeah. Why? When you could just say, hey, let's go over there. Mm-hmm. If Batman's parents had done that, he, we wouldn't have Batman anymore. Just mm. I know you like the Batman stuff. I, I did too. He was yeah. always my, uh, my favorite growing up. But yeah, uh, yeah the dark But there is the dark aware- awareness. Yeah, yeah. No, the awareness thing. Yeah, we used to do these yeah. things. Uh, I haven't done it for a little while, but, uh, you know, with the kids and it was, uh, hey, walking along and I actually, I'd actually drill it and I'd have two things and it was, uh, uh I think it was down or drop. I've it's been a, been a little bit, but cause they're not, cause they're older, older now, but when they're young, so down, which means there's, there's, there's down on the ground, just freeze yep. and then yep. just drop, you know, and I'll come back right. for you. And the other yep. one cover, yep. cover, and then right. and I'm pointing. Yep. And they're just yep. going to run that direction. Yep. Those are the two yep. things. Like, just remember those two things yep. because it means that I can't grab you for some reason and get you out of there. Right. Um, and yep. I have to go do some work right now. Yeah. Uh, for whatever yep. reason. Uh, you know, obviously, I'd yep. like to just turn and grab and run uh, of course, and take but you. It's not always but an for whatever reason, I don't know what that reason would be. Um, but yep. if that ever were the case, drop is just bam, yep. as flat as you can possibly get against you that ground be, yeah. and then cover, boom, yeah. you know, just a, a point in yeah. a direction and then just run that way to that cover. Right. Um, yeah. Dad, dad's going to work, you know, especially if people are yeah. after or shooting me and I'm the bullet sponge, like a vehicle overseas, well, yeah. you know, that thing, your yep. vehicle can just, you know, it's a bigger target, yep. be a bullet sponge. Yeah. So I'm going to go. Bullet sponge. Maybe, One I'm of my gonna... favorite parts of a, uh, uh, devil's hand. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Awesome, yeah, man. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I did think about that. It's things that, you know, I do think about with, uh, you know, wife and kids and, and all, and all the rest of it, just cause it seemed not like a natural thing to, to do as a, and you can't as, in as this as day and age, you can't say it's not a, a reality because the way that people are spraying things, just getting a stray bullet is, is more common now than anything else. So if you sit there and just get that into their system, the, the likelihood of them not taking a stray from some idiot down the street, who's being an idiot. Um, that's, that's life-saving information. I hope the people listening will sit there and hear that, that you say that and implement it on your, on with your, with the people that you care about. Yeah. Obviously you're not going to do it with grandma because that's not going to work out well. She'll break a hip, but if they're kids, teach them those things. Those we'll give, are, that's we'll, we'll give grandma right a belt fed and she can just <laughs> yeah. take care of, take care of business, you know, hey. yeah, just put the locks hey. in on her chair yeah. and just let if her you go. Can't, yeah. If you can't run away, you got to stand and fight, you know, might as well, yeah. uh, might as well be with a belt grandma. Fed, you know? Yeah. yeah. Cho- choose your state and city wisely. Um, <laughs> yeah. oh, man, wild, wild. But, uh, dude, man, how's your, how's, how's your son doing now? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Um, so he is good and he's good because I haven't heard anything bad. His mother and I are, uh, we're not talking that much, but I have an opportunity later on this year to go back to Vancouver for a project. Uh, and it's at that point in time, I'm going to go see him face to face, see her and, and, and make some amends. Uh, I've carried a lot of shame for a lot of years with regards to him and her. And it's not something that, that can be done over the phone, especially with my son, because he, he doesn't talk and he's, you know, he's, he doesn't communicate in, in, in traditional senses. I need to go and sit next to him and hold his hand and look him in the eyes and, and apologize and, and, and ask forgiveness in, from him uh, and from her. I, I need to admit to my, my faults as a, as a husband and as a father. And it's not something that can be done on a FaceTime situation. Uh, 
Uh, and so when, when this project presented itself, I just looked up and went, thank you, because you know, traveling to Canada couldn't have happened over the last couple of years just with COVID. But now that things are, you know, ish, when the pres- opportunity presents itself, I'll be able to go and, and, and do what's needed to be done. I, I think that this doesn't apply to, to just parents of special needs children. I think it's just parents in general. We all feel like we failed our children in some way, shape, or form. I don't know. I've not met a parent yet that has not felt a little bit of shame or guilt because of work or the way they snapped at them or the way that they punished them. And it's easy for me to say, I don't know, say I'm talking to you and say, you know what, Jack Carr, I need you to show yourself some grace to who you were at that time. However that time was, you're not the same man now that you were then. So please show that version of you a little bit of grace. And that gives you permission to go and to talk to your kids and apologize. I don't have that luxury because I don't know if my son actually understands what I'm saying. So I'm doing it really for me because I need to heal that part of my heart because it's, it's been, you know, seven, eight, nine, almost 10 years of me feeling like a dirt bag and no parent deserves to do that. No parent, no parent needs to, to walk around with more guilt and shame than they already have for, for being a parent in general, right? But he's good. As far as I know, I stalk him on uh, his mother on social media quite a bit. I haven't seen anything negative and she would, I believe in my heart that she would reach out and be like, listen, he's had a bad turn or he's not doing well or whatever. Um, and I have not heard anything. So in this, in this situation, uh, no news is good news. How old is he? 1997. So 24. I, I suck at math. I suck yeah. at math. But he's, you know, and he's, you know, I see pictures of him. He's a man. He's got, you know, hair on his face and, you know, hair where hair grows on boys. And he's, he's such, a, I'm preaching to the choir here because, you know, when you have a child, anybody who's listening that has a child or knows somebody that has a special need, there's a gift that they end up getting that, children who don't have special needs don't end up getting they just get a little extra smile or they have a little extra behavior that is so beautiful and 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 only they can do it yeah you know and my son has a laugh you know i've i've posted it a couple of times he has a laugh that i've watched with my own my own eyes melts the devil's heart i've seen him turn an ugly situation into a beautiful situation and his smile and and his look it's it's, it's something that I wish I had not taken for granted. Yeah. I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now, you know? Okay. And I think that if any parent gets that message, if you have some, a child in general or a special needs child, you know, hug them. Like, for example, I won't say you, but let's say another parent, right? And I, I've met parents who say they have children with Down syndrome, who I just, man, you, you want to you wanna know what love is? Maybe at Lucky Coffee or Lucky Cafe. Lucky Ones, yeah. Right? Lucky Ones Coffee. Right? Right? You sit there and you get a hug. And I've said this to parents. Does your child tell you they love you? And they're like, yes, they do. In their own way or they verbalize it. I said, I would cut my left arm right now. I would cut it off right now to have my son tell me one time, I love you, dad, and to give me a hug. I would take it. Surgically take it off right now. Just for one time, I would take that. And, and I think that that's my purpose in, in many ways is to remind parents that whether you have special needs or not is you get this gift, you get this blessing. Yeah, they're little shits. That's what children are supposed to be. They're supposed to be like, you want to strangle them. But the fact that they will hug you and love you and, and, and give you a purpose of life, man, just embrace that and, and, and shake off your, what you did in the past and love your kids. Anyways, that's. I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but uh, hopefully somebody will hear this and, and, and cut themselves some slack, you know? And man, before we go, I wanted to ask you also, when did the firearms training come in? Cause I see some pictures of you out there. I see a training yeah. and I'm like, where did that come yeah. in? Was it the, the crowd? Well, you know, it wasn't from or, Canada. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, was it, yeah. Is it always like introduced <laughs> through that? And then you got more into it in yep. Arizona and Texas. Yep. Or how did that go? My very first time uh, was in, when I went to Israel. Okay. And doing the old Jerichos. And I already have PTSD from just the Jerichos and having to, so my hands were just a wreck. Cause you know, they don't, they don't carry in the chamber. Right. Mm-hmm. So, or usually they don't. 
so that from there, and then when I first came to Texas, you know, you get to get some information and then it really, Arizona started getting a little bit more. And then since I've been here, I've been blessed with so many men and women who are really good at what they do to open up the opportunities to learn so that I'm, I'm familiar with whatever platform is lying on the ground. Because for me, firearms are just a tool. I, if it's lying there, I want to be able to pick it up and use it, which, you know, Clint Smith is, is such a, yeah, yeah. the old bugger. I, he, he just, that's his mindset is I've just kind of absorbed it and been like, yep, I just need to be able to pick this up, be able to manipulate it so that it works and, and, and use that tool for what its purpose is. And, and, and that, yeah. So Texas, definitely Texas, Arizona has been the two areas that firearms have really just opened up. Yeah. And a lot of good people to train with in, in both those states. So yeah, Man. yeah, true. Dude, this was awesome getting able to catch up with you for a little bit well, and uh, and hear that you're working on the skill set magazine stuff, figuring out the next yeah. uh, the next chapter. Really, I mean, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, yeah. See what you're yeah. doing going forward, but uh, love the positive influence that you have on everyone around you. Uh, being able to go back to some of those darker times. So if you have a, a yeah. touch point with people that are going through some some serious issues in the present and yeah. uh, and be a, yeah. a positive influence and add value to their life. So, uh, man, it's uh, yeah. Yeah, love what you're doing out there, and I appreciate you taking the time today to sit down oh. and hang out for a bit. Come on now, I've I've been since we first talked about doing this. I've been there's been a calendar on my thing. I've been giddy. Ah. I know what it's like to be. You think I'm joking? I'm not. I I don't think people fully understand just how much I appreciate you and this and this opportunity. It's a big thing for me. Oh, it's man. huge. Awesome. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, check out your stuff in, in skill set and then, uh, on, yeah. on Instagram and, and as well. Yeah. So looking forward to your next article and, uh, hopefully yes, we'll link you. up in, in person here, uh, again soon. Very soon. I'm, I'm confident about that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Hey, thanks so much. And we'll, uh, we'll talk soon. I appreciate it, Jack. Later, brother. A special thanks to our presenting sponsor, Navy Federal Credit Union. I have been a member since 1996. There is my cue card right there. Man, Navy Federal has been with me every step of the way uh, while I was in the military for those 20 years. And now that I am out and they've taken care of me, taken care of my family um, and have had nothing but the best experience with them. So to have them sponsor this podcast is uh, well, it's humbling and I am, I am honored. Uh, becoming a member at Navy Federal Credit Union lets you experience more from everyday commutes to your next big vacation. The flagship credit card earns you three times the points on travel so you can get rewarded for wherever you're headed next. Plus, this premium travel card has a low annual fee of $49 and two times the points on all purchases outside of travel, meaning the rewards don't have to end even when the vacation does. Speaking of rewards, you can get a Navy Federal Auto Loan and reward yourself with a new car. Applying is easy. You can do it on their mobile app, online, or by phone, and it's so fast, you can get a decision in seconds. Navy Federal has great rates on auto loans. Plus, with their car buying service powered by True Car, you can shop, compare, and get upfront pricing on your next new or used car. At Navy Federal, members are the mission. Navy Federal is insured by NCUA. It is open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. Flagship rates are variable and range between 10.74% and 18% APR based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Credit and collateral subject to approval. Message and data rates may apply. Visit NavyFederal.org for more information and to apply. I want to thank my friends at Black Rifle Coffee for sponsoring the Danger Close podcast. I've been a huge fan for the longest time. Drink Black Rifle Coffee every day. And if you keep your eyes peeled, you will notice that perhaps Chris Pratt is wearing a Black Rifle Coffee t-shirt, not unsimilar to this one, in the Amazon series adaptation of The Terminal List. Now you can go to blackriflecoffee.com slash dangerclose and use code dangerclose 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Black Rifle Coffee, America's Coffee, keep crushing. Today's gear segment is sponsored by Schnee's. And 
Go to schnees.com. Check out all they have going on. They have a ton of great things on their website. Uh, check them out on Instagram. But today I want to talk about boots because I love everything that they have going on up there, but I probably have 10 different pairs of their boots, but I started with these right here, the granites. And I love these boots. I got my first elk in these, uh, muzzleloader hunt, New Mexico, about a decade ago. These are the exact same boots right here. So they have some miles on them. They have been to uh, Alaska after bear, wolf, uh, moose, and I just love these boots. So if I go into the back country, and I have some weight on my back and I'm planning on coming out even a little heavier, then these are the boots that I take. I was wearing these in Kamchatka, Russia on a bear hunt where I went to do some research for Savage Sun. And for those of you who know Savage Sun, that's my third novel in the James Reese series. And uh, you know, a lot of it takes place there. And then there's a little story that I fictionalized and dropped into Alaska in that uh, in that story near kind of closer to the beginning. But these are the boots that I wore. Absolutely love these boots right here and love all the people at Schnee's and just can't say enough good things about them. But they are handcrafted in their Italian boot factory. That's right. You'll find no mass production machinery there. Just a team of world-class boot makers doing their thing. Schnee's only sells boots directly to you, the consumer. This means there is no middleman markup like other boot companies out there. That means that they can put higher emphasis on the materials that go into their boots and you get more boot for the money, higher quality materials and more boot for the money. From the leathers to the tread, every Schnee's boot is made from the absolute finest materials available, backed by Schnee's industry-leading customer service and support. If you have a question or need a solid boot recommendation for your hunt, give them a call. You'll actually get a person on the line who wears the boots and is ready to help. There are a lot of boots out there uh, in their lineup. So definitely give them a call, let them know what you're going to be doing, and they can make a recommendation for you. When you shop at, shop at schnees.com, that is S-C-H-N-E-E-S.com, make sure you use the promo code JACK21. When you do, you'll get 10% off your pair of Schnee's boots and logo wear. Again, that is S-C-H-N-E-E-S. Dot com promo code Jack 21. These handmade hunting boots usually sell out fast. So grab your pair today. Take care of your feet. Don't compromise. Upgrade to Schnee's today. Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the danger close podcast. All right. Aster knives right here. Oh yeah. A C H T E R knives. Check him out. Makes, uh, makes more than axes obviously makes knives as well but look at that different sizes right here different uh different models pretty sweet i mean really like these uh these little hatchets these little axes right here and love what herman is doing out there at Astor knives so uh herman thank you so much and uh definitely check him out once again a c h t e r knives check those out and leslie's fine art Go to Instagram, check out what she has going on. And look at that, Leslie Newman, she made this. So if you've been following me for a while, you know that I gave my kids uh, four gifts at my retirement from the military. Uh, I gave them a Bible and a compass, an old nautical compass uh, to help guide them along their path in life. Uh, I gave them a leather-bound copy of the Constitution, and then I gave them a Winkler tomahawk and said, here's the means to defend it. So anyway, look at that. So Leslie Newman, Leslie's fine art on Instagram. Uh, thank you for sending this and thank you for your kind note on the back. Uh, really means, means a lot to me. So thank you. What else do I have here? Filson. Yep. Extra tough boots, little collaboration. Just got these guys, uh, these waterproof, extra tough Filson lace up boots right there. Look at that. That is Nice. So I'm going to give these a run here soon. We've been getting some rain out here in Utah, some surprise rain. I've been locked in here uh, doing things for the premiere and writing book six and a bunch of other things, but I'm uh, looking forward to giving these guys a run right here. Extra tough. Filson, obviously Filson, incredible company, been around for a long time, making some great stuff. So be sure and check them out. All right. Till the next time. Thank you for tuning into the Danger Close podcast. An Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union.
To find out more about Marcus Torgerson, you can go to his website, and that is M A R C U S T O R G E R S O N dot com. You can also follow him on the social channels at Marcus Torgerson and check out his articles on Skillset Magazine. If you enjoyed this conversation, be sure and leave a five star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow me at Jack Carr USA on the social channels. Officialjackcar.com is the website. You can sign up for the newsletter there. And jackcarusa.com is for the merch. Until the next time, take care out there. Be safe, stay strong, keep fighting.